Well, I would like first to welcome you all and thank you for coming on a Saturday afternoon on your weekend. Uh, this is an important topic and part of a series of uh, discussions and conversations taking place through the, uh, through the Maria project and uh, we thank the Barjeev Art Foundation for hosting this uh, event today and all the participants as well. Uh, cultural identity is a political construct that may refer to any one of a combination of designations from gender, race, ethnic, ethnicity, religious affiliation, nationality, place of birth, sexual orientation, political and professional affiliations, or a number of other historical and other references that have occupied professionals, intellectuals from Socrates to Freud. These cultural markers we refer to as identity, identities have taken on different meanings at different times and locations depending on, the depending on the geographical interpretations by the self or by others. Wars, globalization and consequently displacement is shaping the discourse on identity and representation. A, new, a recent UN report finds 43.7 million people worldwide are were forcibly dis displaced by conflict, and there are now 175 million migrant workers around the world. These trends are changing the way we look at cultures, whether our own or as a nation, as a minority, or as well as as well as our relationship with others within professional groups such as artists and art practitioners. Discourse on national identity in all its manifestations over the last 100 years is closely linked with modern and postmodern paradigms. This was always reflected in the art of the culture and culture of the region. Taking Egyptian art for as an example, in the 1920s, artists rever reverted to their pharaonic roots and 30 years later, however, and after the end of the British-supported monarchy, they developed a national style celebrating freedom from foreign rule with short-lived optimism, followed by a reinterpretations of the Arab Islamic artistic traditions through calligraphy. And now we witness a new start of a new era in Egypt that is still too early to imagine its consequences. There are a number of factors shaping the discourse of art of the regions. These include the emergence of new art form from the region, the unprecedented interest in the region's art, the recent discovery of Arab art by the, Western, by the West, the imposed Western interpretations and categorization of the art of the region, and the emergence of art as a hot commodity on the art market. It also, also recently we have new winds of change with the Arab Spring that is promising a new, a new look, a new representation of art. Today we are joined by four panelists who will examine how these and other relatively recent categories are challenging the notion of identity as it relates to visual art. Begin with uh, Sultan Al Qasimi, who is a columnist of, for Gulf News in Dubai. His column have appeared in the National Financial Times, the Independent, the Guardian, New York Times, and the Huffington Post, the Hindu and Lebanese uh, Daily Star, Gulf Business, and Arab News, amongst others. Sultan Al Qasimi is also a non-resident fellow at the Dubai School of Government. And uh, for us, most importantly, Sultan is the founder of the Bergil Art Foundation. We're very grateful for that. Sultan has a unique collection of Arab art. Uh, Dr. Sharon Parker, who is uh, sitting at my far left, has a PhD in comparative literature and cultural studies from the University of Arizona. She has lived in Iran for many years and also worked in Kuwait and the UAE. Sharon's research focus is on Iranian art, and her PhD dissertation examined the work of Iranian women artists. She has also taught and written on Emirati art and culture. And she has taught until recently at the Zayed University for many years, and she will soon leave us to dedicate her time to research and writing. Today, Sharon will discuss her in her comments on diaspora and on non-diaspora art, 
taking Iranian artists in America, in America as an example. And Sharon will touch on the outcome of rupture, separation, and difference, or the new forces that may be contributing to the convergence of these two. Sultan al Qasimi will be challenged by questions, I'm sure <laughs> that he will have no problem answering. <laughs> And uh, his, uh, you are all most familiar with his writing, so we will wait to see how, what angle he will take on this subject. Next is Isabella uh, Elahi Hughes. Isabella is a curator and art critic. She's sitting next to Dr. Sharon over there, and is a consultant to art and cultural institutions in the US, UK, and in the UAE. She is the Dubai editor for Art Asia Pacific and has contributed to Freeze, Persianesque, Contemporary Practices, and to Brown Book. She has curated several exhibitions for art institutions, including the Smithsonian National Museum in DC, the Center for Contemporary Art in Seattle, and uh, the Mariah Art Center in Sharjah, and for the United States Embassy in, in Abu Dhabi. Isabella has a BA in art history from Boston University, and an MA in museum studies from John Hopkins University. Uh, he, uh, Isabella specializes in contemporary art with a research focus on the rise of trans culture, focusing on art from the Middle East, Asia, and the Pacific. Today, Isabella will share with us her experience working with artists in the region and their divergent views on representation or the categorization of their art. She will also present ways we could deal with such identification when curating exhibitions. On my right is the Emirati artist, Ibtissam Abdelaziz, uh, who is a writer and a curator. One of the leading conceptual artists in the Gulf, Ibtissam's work has been shown at Sharjah, Venice, and Singapore Biennales, as well as at many local, regional, and international exhibitions from Denmark, Germany, to Dubai, and Sharjah Art Museum, among many others. She has also curated the annual Emirati Fine Art Exhibition at the Sharjah Art Museum last year. Ibtisam takes a pragmatic approach to her analysis of identity. And today, we will uh, learn more about what concerns Ibtisam as a conceptual artist in the formation of her artistic expression as defined by the temporality of art production. Ibtisam will examine how universal human ideas shape her art over time in her discussion as well. So we're going to start with you, Tissam. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like uh, to thank you, Salwa, for the nice introduction. Um, as I said, uh, I'm a conceptual artist. Um, today, we're going to talk about different subjects. One of them is uh, the national and the identity and uh, being a conceptual artist in, uh, in the Gulf or in the UAE. Uh, I'll, I have some points I'd like to just say them briefly. Uh, first of all, my idea of making art is, um, is, is to deal with any uh, human issues and, uh, and, then, and then produce some artwork that we represent that issues uh, or, or in, in a different medium. So I have no medium to, to, to practice or deal with. And then uh, secondly, I'd like to mention that in my opinion, a true artist uh, should seek to express themselves with the tools of their time. So I think that's, that's very important because we can't live in the past. We need to use the tools that within our, uh, our uh, region or in our century. And then uh, I'd like also to mention the idea of, um, uh, as, as an artist, uh, we can't detach from the daily events and daily life and everything surrounding us. So most of my work, or I think most of the artist work will, will deal with uh, every day's life and issues, like anything in life that could affects us or even um, push us to, to produce work because I think the concept or the message behind each piece is the most important element. No, come here. Okay. Can you? 
as uh, an Emirati artist uh, is, uh, is accelerating the changes in our environment. Um, so so as we were talking about that, as, as an, an artist or as an Emirati artist, uh, I speak, I think, for my nation. I have a lot of messages. So, so the reason why I became an artist is sometimes before I felt that we are we're not uh, attached to our nation. I have, I think there is a huge gap between my way of thinking and my people or my community. And I think um, this, this happened um, uh, uh, in 2007, I felt that I need to do something and I need to speak up about this issue uh, because um, Sometimes we felt that we are, as, as an artist, is, is treated as, um, as if we are uh, just a subject. We're not a human anymore. Sometimes we feel that we lose our identity in our community. Then we feel the alienation. And uh, add to that, I think there is a gap between, um, between the goals of uh, uh, the materialistic uh, community that we're living in and also the, 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 the value of the human and the standard of the society. So what, those, those are one of the subjects that I really love to talk about it when we talk about the nationality. And um, one thing more, uh, speaking about me being a conceptual artist, uh, sometimes we, we ask ourselves where do we belong to? And I think, um, I think art is a universal thing, has nothing to do with the, the nationality. And um, the, the good art speak about itself, whether it's from the UAE or it's from other parts of the world. But what makes it different is the, the, the surrounding or the events that uh, encourage the artist or that made the, the art piece. Um, I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, comment on uh, diaspora and non-diaspora art. Um, again, particularly in regards to Iran, which has been my primary research area, although I have done some research here in the Emirates as well, and also Kuwait. Um, according to um, Abbas Milani, who's the director of Iranian studies at Stanford University, the state of exile is when you live in one land and you dream in another. You live in one language and you dream in another language. Of course, with the um, migration and with uh, not only migration, but um, because of diaspora, but also because of work issues and so on, many people speak multiple languages. That's not an unusual kind of, kind of state of affairs. Nevertheless, in regards to Iran in particular, um, the rupture that resulted from the 1979 revolution appeared to have created a kind of two strands of art. Um, the strand that then became known as diaspora art, uh, exemplified by artists like Shirin Nishad and others, who primarily had a dialogue with the West as opposed to uh, with the Middle East. Her dialogue, her audience was primarily from the West. And those who remained in Iran and took another tact, uh, which I suppose in some ways also um, would include um, well, several different artists. Um, Parviz uh, Tanaboli is someone who sort of crosses between two areas, both inside and outside. My question always is, is the art that's produced inside or outside a result of uh, the factors that drive an artist to create or produce, or are these externally um, framed by market, uh, the art market in particular, or where one can show one's work? Um, and so that, that's a question for me with, with a number of these artists. Also a question to me is, is it possible to um, expand the idea of um, this dislocation of artworks um, in multiple areas? For example, Palestinian art. Is, is Palestinian art inside and outside? Or is it Palestinian art? How do we define that? As opposed to diaspora art with Iran, and non-diaspora art with Iran. So, so these are these are questions for me. 
Um, I think that um, if you look in particular at the Iranian work, which I'll just briefly go into, Iran has a long history, as many other cultures do as well. Many other countries in the region have an extremely long history of producing artwork. This is not a new thing. Working in contemporary or modern artworks is not a new thing, whether we're looking at Lebanon or um, Palestine or Egypt or any number of countries. Um, the UAE, it comes just a little bit later, but it doesn't come all that much later. Most artists with their training, uh, the training began through uh, association and um, contact with other Western artists or institutions and so on. So that the technique, I think that's what uh, Eptison was possibly also talking about, that you have to have the tools of the trade before you produce whatever it is, right? And so those are kind of a given. But then what you do with that depends upon how you want to self-identify. And if it is um, either of national concern as it is here, identity is a very big issue in the UAE, um, whether it's a national identity issues or, um, again, issues that have to do more with the marketplace and where one can produce and sell one's work, um, is still nonetheless, uh, some things are, are similar, I think. Many things are quite different. I'm going to stop here. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. Thank you, Stella, for your introduction and Sultan and Mandy for organizing this. Um, my comments are coming primarily from the work that I do, which, as you know, is an independent curator and a critic. Um, and this idea of nationality, identity, and art is quite interesting to me because I feel that there is such an interest in it regionally and internationally, dare I even say an obsession. And I often wonder, where does all this emphasis on nationality and identity come from? Does it come from the institutions that are supporting artists? Does it come from collectors? Does it come from the artists themselves, perhaps living in diaspora, or as transcultural migrants who want to hold on to culture and identity while not really operating in their country of ethnic origin? Um, and I think probably when you're talking to artists, it definitely varies from artist to artist. The reason, if they are doing work that does address nationality, why they're doing so, and I think um, Sharon's comments about the market, they're quite clear that they do produce two types of work, work that is playing into this interest in nationality and identity, because that's what sells. And at the end of the day, artists have families, they have bills to pay, um, and they need to survive. And then they also produce work that perhaps isn't so focused on national identity, that's more an independent conceptual practice. But there are three brief points I want to make today. And the first is that curators, institutions, the larger arts infrastructure, when working with contemporary artists from the region, must really listen to them and listen to their practice. Because all too often, there are artists from the region, whether they live here or they're in diaspora in another country, and their work has absolutely nothing to do with culture or identity, yet they are categorically shift, um, put into the box of Arab artist, Iranian artist. Um, so the beauty of us live, working with living contemporary artists is that we can listen to what they say. Um, going off that point, if they are saying their work is about identity and culture and their work is addressing this, it's an important, um, there's an important distinction between diaspora artist and non-diaspora artist. I come from a background, as you know, in museum studies, so I'm very interested in the way that audiences are receiving artwork. Um, particularly not in the region. And so often I've gone to exhibitions and it's a statistical fact that 15 to 20 percent of people actually read exhibition labels or catalog text. So if they're looking at an image, they're not going to really read the information. They just hear Iranian artist or Emirati artist. And regardless if the artist lives or operates in that country or not, they're going to just visually read that work and make an assumption about the culture. And often we have numerous famous um, diaspora Arab and Iranian artists who have never even lived in their country. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Um, to address and to really understand the distinction. There was a great show a few years ago, Iran Inside Out, and that was a show where there was that distinction. I think the first time a really important large show that traveled internationally that put there were two sides to the story, Iranians living and working in Iran and outside, and I hope we see more of that. Um, going from that, the third point I briefly want to make is that it seems that the arts infrastructure is set up to not support artists who are from the region ethnically that aren't creating work that deals with identity and culture. Let's look at the prizes. 
Jamil Prize, the Raj Capital Art Prize, the auction system, even the institutional opportunities outside of this region, they're not supporting artists who are one of first to be identified as contemporary artists and their work has nothing to do with identity and culture. Um, as an independent curator, I always work with outside institutions and 99% of the time, if I'm approached by an institution student exhibition or I pitch a show, I will only get it if it's framed by ethnic identity. And I think that's quite frustrating. And just two brief examples are two artists I've worked with, um, one of them, Pounem Ghazé, the other, Hedia Shafi, both are Iranian-American artists. I worked with them in 2009 in a show I curated called I Ran Home in America. At the time, both artists were essentially at the same point in their career. Pune Merazé was a bit more famous. She was in the show Iran Inside Out. She would showed at Leila Heller Gallery. And both their work dealt with identity and culture. Since then, Hedi Shafi has continued to do work that's identity and culture related. Pune Merazé has not. Hedi Shafi was shortlisted for the Jamil Prize. I had the opportunity to nominate her. She's selling like hotcakes at Kasha Hildebrand. Pune Merazé's work is very, very interesting, so conceptually challenging, and it keeps evolving over the past four years. Why Hedia's looks the same, and she has virtually no real exhibition opportunities, commercial success. So I just hope that all of us in the arts will continue to leave room to support artists from the region who are working, perhaps not actually in ethnic and cultural mm -hmm. perspectives. Yeah. Thank you, Isabella. Great mm -hmm. introduction. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Very good. Last but not least, Sultan. I want to echo what Sam said. Um, sometimes the best art is art that is not boxed in uh, an identity or a nationality. Um, I have a problem with what, what also what Isabel said. Um, um, it was an important, was an important point that uh, we sometimes frame artworks as in this is Saudi, this is Kuwaiti, this is Emirati mm -hmm. art, and that that is not the way you should talk about art. You should talk about art. I think this is good art, or this is of a higher quality or lesser quality art. Um, uh, being involved in this art foundation, uh, I've met a lot of officials and a lot of government. In, uh, um, representatives and artists themselves who I felt are under pressure to represent what Emirati art, what Emirati identity looks like. But this is not the uh, objective of art. It is just to create something meaningful, something beautiful, something that makes a statement. And uh, we've seen, there, there's a very famous artist that I won't, uh, I won't uh, mention uh, his name, but a very famous artist from the UAE who was active in the 70s and the 80s and he came under a lot of pressure, and, and, and finally he was uh, shunned by the, by the official circles because he wasn't representing uh, Emiratis in this, uh, in this way that, they, that the officials mm. wanted them to be represented as. And it was, it was only kind of um, uh, allowed to, 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 uh, to, uh, to be representative, uh, represented in official uh, newspapers uh, just a few years ago. So there was a, almost a 25-year gap that this artist disappeared from, from the news. He wasn't even allowed to be interviewed or anything. So uh, th there is pressure. Also, I've noticed that uh, th because these countries in the Gulf are very young, the, the, the governments are trying to find an identity for the nationals that are separate from the, 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 the neighboring country. So uh, we are Emirati, we are different from the Qataris. The Qataris are different from the Bahrainis, and they're different from the Saudis. And in fact, there's a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of pressure to emphasize the differences, to emphasize uh, uh, even the way that the, 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 the clothes are worn or the, uh, the background of the image. Um, so uh, we, we've seen this happen, happen more and more. I, I think that uh, the, the, the artists need to uh, uh, break free of what is expected from them. And these are the artists that really excel in the end, rather than the artists that uh, con constantly uh, try and uh, appease the, uh, the, the government. One of the artists, you'd see a lot of his work hanging in many of the hotels, especially and the government uh, uh, authorities. Uh, his work is, is beautiful, but because he is, a, uh, he is only identified as a government artist, uh, he is unable to truly uh, excel and, and uh, as Sam uh, said earlier, go crazy. And this is what we, we need to push these young artists to just, you know, go crazy and, and create something that is completely spectacular rather than something that is framed within what the government uh, does or does not recognize. 
I'd like to pose a few questions to the panelists and starting with Sultan actually. I wanted to ask what if a visitor or a reader or uh, someone 20 years from now wants to look back at this period, what's happened and what's the sort of zeitgeist of the culture and art of the um, Dubai, let's say, during or Sharjah, uh, during this un uh, unprecedented construction period or development time. Uh, would you say there is anything, spe there is a specific, uh, let's say, intellectual discourse that's taking place here that differentiates this region from other Arab countries? And if so, how is this relationship between the uh, Emirati or even other intellectuals living in the Gulf and visual art? Um, it's important to say that. Uh, the UAE and the Gulf to a large degree is a very transient society. So we cannot identify uh, Im artists who have Emirati nationality uh, uh, completely separately than artists who are uh, uh, expatriates who live in the UAE full time or who just uh, happen to visit. So uh, some of the best art about the UAE is created by expats who, who live here. And, and uh, some of the, uh, uh, and some of the uh, most prominent Emirati artists are influenced by by, by, the, by this transient nature of society. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, 20 years from now, I think that uh, one would be hard pressed to say this specific artist represents, uh, represents Emirati. Uh, and it might even be an artist who is non-Emirati. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other point of view is you have an institutionalization now happening in the Gulf uh, with what Isabel mentioned uh, are the awards. Um, and, uh, and the Madhav Museum in, uh, in Qatar, and the museum here in Sharjah. Um, my, my, my issue is uh, many of these museums don't display a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, collection. Uh, even the Qatar Museum took down the, uh, the Arab collection and put up a Chinese artist uh, the last few months. Uh, I also think that we should recognize the, the huge influence of Iranian art. What, what, Sharon, what Sharon mentioned, the Iranian uh, diaspora is very active in the UAE. You cannot talk about UAE art without mentioning uh, uh, the Iranian artists um, like the Hayar Zadeh brothers um, uh, and so many others that I, I, I will forget if I mention all their names. But um, the, the discourse is not just within Emiratis, but because unlike say in, in Egypt and in other countries in the region where you have a, a very strong uh, uh, contemporary art scene within the country, but because of because the UAE is very transient and, and has what 180 nationalities living here, um, the the discourse is happening between Arabs and between Arabs themselves and between Arabs and expats from the east and from the west, and that's why you uh, the, the art movement is growing in leaps and bounds in the UAE mm -hmm. because of yeah. this trend because of this nature of society here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess this is quite representative of the panel itself, in a way, mm -hmm. and um, make, which does make the region unique, which uh, compared to the other Arab regions. But that, well, I would go back now to asking uh, uh, Isabella in, re uh, in reference to the idea of that you you're against identifying artists from a specific country in your, in your exhibitions. Now, in the 90s, there were several, many exhibitions in New York and the US and even in Europe that are uh, specific to geographies. Uh, so there was uh, uh, art from China, from India, mm -hmm. from uh, more recently China, uh, the African art exhibition in, in France. So there, there are still these exhibitions uh, going around and major artists participate in these exhibitions. But what is noticeable is that uh, the label uh, does reads uh, something like more uh, born in uh, Beirut, uh, living and working in London, or living and working in London, Paris, and New York. Uh, so you as a curator who specializes in the region, how do you strategize uh, when you curate an exhibition? How do you strategize in, as far as how you represent the artists uh, at least with the ID, and the ID label, which specifies yeah. the... Well, no, I'm not totally against identity and culture. Like, one of my first points was I work with living artists, and it's about listening to them and what their work is addressing and how they're representing. Some artists, their practice, it's inherent that they're talking about Palestinian issues, while other artists, it's really not relevant. 
Um, but it is a struggle. This has sort of been a new shift for me this past six months, a year, deciding to really want to work and curate exhibitions that aren't focused on identity. Um, it means a lot of fewer opportunities. I think a lot of curators do struggle with this because, again, everybody wants to show artists, and if the opportunity is to show at a national museum like the Smithsonian, and the only way you're going to do that and get funding is if you do an ethnic show, well, at the end of the day, what happens for the artist? A lot of times the career is the one for success. My own career as a curator is more reputable. Um, but it is important to me, again, to listen to the artist. If the artists don't want to be identified as ethnic identity, I really don't want to mention it in the text, in the labels. Um, it is important to see labels that do say where someone was born and where they work. There actually are quite a few exhibitions I've seen, always in the West, where they just label the artist as Egyptian and the artist doesn't live or work in Egypt and hasn't for 15 or 20 years. When, do you find any affinities with the Marathi writers? I mean, when, when you do, you, you have connections, you read Emirati literature in Arabic. And how do you feel if there is any connections between what you do and what an Emirati writer does? Sometimes it, it says um, different stories. Um, like, for example, if I read something about a story or a novel or anything about the UAE, yes, it gives me an idea and inspiration uh, I could do something related to that, and also the movies, it, it does affect us as, as, a, as an artist. Uh, well, I, we, we just want to see if there is a professional affinity between your, your group of uh, Emirati uh, artists and Emirati writers. <laughs> I mean, do they, they, they? Yeah, I do. So I have, you think I have there a is? lot of friends, uh, writers. We met sometimes whenever we get the chance. We talk about, uh, they're talking about their issues, their challenge, and we're sharing things together. Uh, it affects, in a way, um, something could inspire me that happened, for example, to Mohammed al Mazroui. He's a best, a close friend of mine. He's a writer. So, yes, we do. So. So the, 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 what I was uh, trying to find out is actually uh, this kind of relationship between the artist and the writer, this, this, the, if it does create a, a discourse on the culture, on the national culture of the UAE in general, I mean, is, is that something that we don't uh, touch upon because it could be possibly become more Emirati, so we leave it alone? Or, or you go back to this, uh, what you had mentioned earlier, that your work is more uni de dealing, deals more with universal issues to be rather honest, than specifics. Uh, to be honest, in 2004, I started to read and publish because I was rejected at the beginning. No one accepts what I'm doing, uh, thinking that that's, that has nothing to do with art. No one understands the systematic or the conceptual or using my body to perform a piece. So the main reason for me to write is to, to educate people, although I think it's not the artist's job, but maybe we could help. So most of my writings are either something that I translated from the West, something in English to Arabic, uh, and then I do write something about me or the exhibitions that I create or the artist. Uh, it, it, is, it has an, the, the Emirati identity. So I do both. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm an art historian, and what I find interesting <coughs> is um, how many uh, women artists you're now seeing in the region, uh, which of course was not the case before. Um, in fact, when I teach art history, a lot of my students say to me, why are there so few women artists? So one of the exciting things, I think, for the 21st century, and particularly for the region, is women like Esther who are now able to express themselves through art, uh, where they were not able to before, and they have so much to, uh, to give. Would, would, would people agree with me? Would the panel agree with me? I, I don't necessarily agree that women didn't produce art, but I believe that male-dominated um, publications didn't write about them, um, that there was a kind of an old boys network that wrote about certain other old boys and that left out a lot of very promising female artists. And in fact, I think that until such time as women art historians began to uh, investigate and write about women artists starting in the late 
well, let's see, around the 1980s and through there, that there wasn't much done. What I find lacking, personally, <coughs> is that there, are, there is not yet a lot of writing done about, um, well, Emirati women artists in particular. Um, Iranian women artists are getting much more um, notice than they had in a long time, but there's many women in the region who are not getting as, as much press as they rightfully deserve. When I think of uh, women like um, uh, some of the um, older or first generation Iranian women artists or uh, Lebanese artists, there's many of them who are in their 80s still working, who've had not a lot of writing done about them. And, and so I think that's our responsibility as art historians or cultural theorists to, um, to raise that level of, of discussion, basically. Absolutely, yes. The amount of f women artists and male artists, I think, was roughly an equal ratio. And perhaps yeah. what you theorized is yeah. correct that maybe it was the, the, I guess, infrastructure that was supporting the art. But I've always been so astounded and surprised at how many women artists, there's such a strong history of Arab female modernist artists, mm -hmm. particularly in comparison to the West. And I know this is a point Saul and I have discussed, not today, but at other times, that we need more exhibitions on modern Arab art. So there is an awareness about this. Yeah, I'd like to add to this that uh, there is a great deal of writing in Arabic on Arab women artists, but yeah. not, they were not necessarily segregated <coughs> from the general art scene. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, historically, Arab art in the region did not segregate male or female mm -hmm. artists. They, they both actually received equal attention and support by Arab uh, governments. It was starting from Egypt, where the first woman artist mm -hmm. uh, had an exhibition in 1906, and uh, in, for example, in Iraq, the first uh, woman artist received a scholarship to study in England in 1932. Right. So, the, and the same for uh, Lebanese women artists who were uh, painting the nude along with their male colleagues as mm -hmm. early as the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So, it, the, the situation in the Arab world differs from the West and Europe, as uh, which was referenced by Dr. Sharon as that the historical. Uh, uh, art history books did not uh, acknowledge maybe European artists as they, they, uh, as they did the male. I mean, there are very few and, mentioned And, and, and of course, historically. I mean, the talent um, of, of a lot of the craft work that was produced, the carpets, mm -hmm. for instance, um, a lot of the very fine work that women did, mm -hmm. perhaps is not described in art history as fine art, but it is still very much the artistic tradition, mm -hmm. isn't it? And it goes back hundreds, thousands of years. Yeah, that, 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 that's absolutely true as far as the crafts, but our discussion today re, re, is mm. exclusively on the finer, on fine arts, not that I would like to differentiate in general. But I, I, I think they overlap, <laughs> I really do. Yeah, yeah, but, but in general, as Isabella mentioned, I, I don't think there has ever been a segregation of mm. male and female artists in the region. I, until I wasn't referring so much broken. to segregation. What, what I was talking about is just this kind of explosion of talent. I decide to speak up for uh, the women in, in the whole world. So I decide to um, do a performance <coughs> and um, to send a message and talk about us as a woman in, in, in this world, uh, talk about uh, the issues that we're suffering from, uh, whether related to the society, the culture, the, the religion, the political, everything. And I decide to do a performance piece, um, very minimal. That, that's me, I don't want to, I hate to show something that very often did I love to show something very mystery, so then I will have the dialogue between the audience, everybody who, who is attracted by this piece. That was in, in the Biennale last year, series uh, around 45 maybe images uh, of a performance um, of a woman wearing a, a black suit uh, inside a, a circle made of acrylic. And, and it's, it's a different, um, different sizes. So each um, acrylic piece will be um, di different uh, in, in terms of sizes according to the size of my body. So it's me fighting this circle. It's me trying to get my freedom. So it's, it's a message for every single woman in this world fighting. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
very well put. Is the question in the back? I was always um, very keen to see how the artists were actually managing the situation because obviously there were demands on them, on their communities, uh, to, to reflect the national aspirations. Uh, and I saw the artistic community divided in two. Uh, one part taking the official position, if you want, not necessarily the government position, but the, the, the more popular position of the nation. Uh, whilst another group of artists would challenge that and would actually try to see, uh, to reflect a different picture, one that, that, that gives a more, uh, a more equitable uh, view of, uh, of life and also to point out that there are problems in all these societies that are common problems. And I just wonder uh, whether the artists themselves um, understand their power. Uh, because art, especially in the modern world where we have so many uh, ways of communicating it now to a much wider audience, uh, has become a very powerful medium. And I wonder whether the panel thinks that the art, artists in general, maybe using references from the, from the Arab world, understand their power. Um, I don't know if artists understand their power. Uh, yet in the um, in the UAE or in the Gulf, um, we have we have a lot of artists who are from this region who represent us internationally, including uh, Tissam, uh, who exhibit their work uh, in, uh, in 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 Europe, in North America, and in, the, and in Asia. Um, last year was it two years ago or three years ago? There was the uh, the UAE participation in uh, in, in in Venice. Uh, the first time we participated. There was a, um, a mini uh, a mini scandal because we had two pavilions, two official pavilions, and I even wrote about an article and uh, which nobody wanted to publish. So I, I secretly published it and then I said uh, and then I said that it was published. So uh, we had there was a huge board uh, with an Emirati wearing uh, the official outfit, and and he was smoking Marlboro, and I, and, and I was and I was thinking to myself, this is the first impression that the tens of thousands of visitors. To the Venice Biennial Pavilion are going to have of Emirati men. I'm not saying they don't smoke, but no, not all of them do. So uh, the artists, curators have a very, very big responsibility to represent the society, uh, uh, especially if they are in the official pavilion. If they are in an in a, in a unofficial pavilion, it's okay. Uh, second of all, uh, there, is a, there is also the, the use of art for propaganda purposes. Mm -hmm. We've seen this in many countries in the Arab world. To advance your identity and your nationality and the valor of your people. But this also came from the West. You have seen artists like uh, Henry Moore, you know, sent <laughs> out in World War II and before him Delacroix. And, 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 you know, and the, the art during the, uh, the Soviet Empire. All of these artists were uh, in one way or the other connected to the, to the government. Uh, but sometimes they find a way to, to escape this, uh, this connection. Um, once again, uh, you have to keep in mind that it's a very young society, there's a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. so I don't want to put all the blame on the artists or the government. One day in the next 10, 20, 30 years, uh, uh, artists from the UAE, from the region, will find, uh, will find exactly where they want to be. Some of them already have, like Tisam, but many artists are still struggling with this identity because of the va various pressures that they find themselves under. Could I just add one thing to that? And, and that is that artists may not always understand their own power, but governments understand their power. And you need only look to Iran to know that. If you look at Iranian films that come out, some of the Iranian uh, novels that come out, other kinds of writings, even some of the artworks, which slip through the censors there, which is a very complicated process to get something done, um, and get other kinds of um, messages out. That's why they so um, carefully or consistently try to sit on the heads of the artists, basically, there with all of these uh, levels of restrictions. So, so artists may not always know where their power lies, but governments know where that is. Um, no, I find though that artists who are operating almost in a third culture, they're not quite living in their country of origin, they're not living really in diaspora, they're the international artists, 
living in Beirut, Paris, New York, um, they do tend to know the power. The more artists travel and exhibit internationally, they're quite aware, often based on their own um, dialogue and experience with audiences and the reactions. And I, I find that quite interesting in comparison to artists who aren't showing abroad or aren't traveling as much, they don't know yet the power. So I think it's important to um, do a lot of residency programs, exhibitions abroad to get artists more aware of that power. I to ask a question regarding the diaspora. Uh, do you, uh, at your work, do you ever, uh, you, do you ever meet the works of uh, expats who, whose works <coughs> of their work reflect more the country they live in, more than who the, uh, whose their work reflect the country they live in, more than they reflect their original culture? Do you ever pass by that? Absolutely, um, but I do find that with artists who are living in diaspora and creating work that relates to identity and culture, um, there's quite a there's a lot of elements of cognitive dissonance. They sort of are confused. They're operating in both, in a way. But they're definitely artists that operate in both and reflect both. But I wouldn't say necessarily more their new host country or culture. It tends to be kind of even and often confused which I think a lot of us who live in diaspora can relate to. In this region, in this UAE region, uh, how is government helping the amateur artists uh, in order to grow in this uh, region? Could you repeat your question? Like, uh, uh, just to repeat your, 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 your question, what, what is the UAE government doing to support artists? Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, not as much as they should, I think. Uh, let's start with that. But there's a lot happening, actually. In fact, we have uh, institutions like Emirates Foundation, where Ms. Selwa uh, is working. Uh, we, have, uh, we have publications that are published by, for example, Mjallet uh, uh, Dubai Cultural... Dubai uh, so, so Dubai Culture has, a, has a, a superb magazine. The fact that Dubai kind of... Uh, um, what's, what word should I use? allowed a lot of the galleries to open despite the rigid laws that we have in the UAE. You have dozens of galleries opening and operating in Dubai very successfully. It is the hub for, uh, uh, for Iranian, for Arab art. A lot of uh, South Asian art is also sold here in, in the UAE. And this is despite the laws, not because of the laws. The laws don't allow you to do this because uh, you have to have an office and then you have to have a gallery in al -Ghuz. So they've kind of bent the rules for a lot of us. Um, but, the, but that said, it's not enough. Uh, the, 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 laws, uh, the, the, the laws aren't up to, uh, up to par, I think. The insurance laws, the laws of, uh, uh, um, of uh, um, licensing the, uh, uh, the galleries, the laws that allow you to, uh, to uh, import and export art are very confusing, especially because you have uh, uh, free zones and non-free zones, and if, a, if an artwork moves from the free zone to the non-free zone, you have to pay what it goes back next day. So it's very confusing. They, they are doing a lot, but the, the, the fact is that the, the art industry is flourishing because of a, a variety of reasons. The government is definitely one of that causes, but the, the, uh, the people in the UAE, expats and Emiratis together, uh, they are maybe the, the biggest driving force that, uh, that the government has recognized uh, uh, the, in the art industry um, because of them. I remember uh, there was a statistic that said that Dubai Gallery sold about uh, uh, 250 million dirhams worth, of, that's about 60 million dollars worth of art in 2008, 9, 10. That's a huge number for an industry that didn't exist and it created a lot of jobs. So the government kind of recognized them and they've allowed, they've allowed the industry to, uh, to flourish. We have here, uh, uh, Khalil, do you want to say anything? Because uh, you, you work in, uh, in the Dubai culture. I'd love for you to say something, uh, if you don't mind. Well, I, I might mention about, like, you know, uh, Sikh art fair. It's like, you know, if you say, like, you know, as a government uh, side, supporting an immorality artists and local artists. This initiative happened, like, you know, to support the movement of art that's happening in the region, especially if you talk about the UAE at the moment. And uh, so what we did, uh, especially for last uh, Sikh uh, art fair, uh, we have had open call. For everybody who's living in the UAE, they can apply, and that was a purpose, like you know, to educate the public also, is that to show them what exists over here, and also who's like you know, uh, who's into art, how we can support them more, 
by educating them, by like, you know, doing workshop for them, and also give them more publicity, especially the gallery is looking around for like you know, UAE artists or, or, or living artists in the UAE who exist over here. This one of the initiative I can't tell, and uh, the other initiative we're trying also to, to educate the public is like, you know, art in the city, which is like, you know, uh, we're dealing with uh, to, to increase the number of art in the city itself, and that we have an initiative with uh, uh, Dubai property, we use like another you know, big word, is, and also we commission artists that was both Emirati and non-Emirati to have a subject to relate like, to the country and to present the work over there. I think that's, uh, that's good. That's a lot of time. Thank you. A lot of for students as well. Thank you. I, 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 I think we all uh, agree that the uh, artists living in the UAE are actually have a better opportunities than artists living in Tunisia, for example, right. current, especially under the current uh, situation in Tunisia. And generally, uh, for example, the Sharjah Art Foundation and the Sharjah Biennial draw on and support not just the local artists, but uh, international artists and regional artists as well. So there's a great deal of uh, support, I think. Uh, there's a lot of support for students, too, uh, students. for students who are studying right. art. There's a lot of support for them as well in terms of providing opportunities. Okay. Yeah. That's right. There is a question in the back also. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for stimulating our minds with this interesting discussion. Um, I found it interesting that we, we do, as, as individuals, as spectators, we do tend to focus on um, artists question because I'm so often I work in nonprofit art and I'm always focused on institutional response that I've actually never thought about that before um, but I think that it is important in the case of your painting for instance this is just again my personal advice it's not the doctrine of what you're supposed to do but the work isn't about being Tunisian so if I was in that situation I'd discuss the artwork what it is and then at the end mentioned and it's by an artist who's from Tunisia but rather than start off at that focus point it might also be interesting for your guest um, would be surprised at the end that this is a Tunisian artist because often um, artists who aren't making work that's quite ethnographic or cultural, they get the reaction that, oh, this doesn't look like an Emirati artist or a Tunisian. I mean, so many artists I've interviewed and worked with, they consistently are met with those remarks when they're exhibiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting question. Here is next. Hi, um, I can actually add to that because uh, I come from the interior design field and sometimes um, when I do have people who are uh, personally very interested in artwork, um, I always try to implement that into my design. I feel that when you enter someone's home, um, the house speaks about how this person lives, what his interests are, if he travels a lot, if he's got different interests, if he's culturally engaged. Um, and not only through the furniture and color schemes that you use for a personal home, um, it's very much so what hangs on the wall. And it becomes a really very uh, personal kind of, of uh, issue or matter. Um, I had a client two years ago, and um, they had the possibility of buying a beautiful house in Dubai in one of the private areas. And I made a presentation. They liked very contemporary uh, furniture and they were from Indian background. And the thing that struck them in my design proposal was that I put a huge image there of Satish Gushwal. He's being 
a phenomenal artist, um, does different kind of media. Uh, this was a painting with lots of circles, very contemporary. Um, and without going too, in too much into a political kind of theme, um, I put it in there and the client was asking, why did you put this particular artwork there? So, because I feel even if you create a personal home for someone, I feel wherever somebody comes from has also to be reflected into their home. So you have a cultural background, basically, and I think people who own galleries in the UAE um, should also stimulate that when uh, personal buyers or personal homeowners come to their place and buy a very personal piece of artwork. We actually ended up buying two pieces through uh, an Indian art gallery who very interestingly were an investment fund. Um, they basically have owners around the world who have uh, private artworks in their homes and they basically use it as an investment. So basically the artwork swaps around within, within those individuals being part of this investment fund. Um, and we bought two beautiful artworks, um, I think just on the same time frame that Anouf Hussain died, unfortunately, as a brilliant artist, and they're hanging right now in this, uh, in this person's home in Dubai. So I think as being an art uh, interested person, I think you should also relate this always back to the cultural background of your clients, and you can bring them back into their homes. So my question is, what do you feel about that? What you're saying is very, very beautiful, and not to be the downer on the conversation, but I'm privy to a lot of um, confessions from artists, many artists that I won't name their names, but they're in the big museums, Tate Modern Collection, so forth. And the truth is, a lot of artists, they are milking the system, and they know that if they are going to go out there and start out their career as being marketed as an Arab artist, an Iranian artist, they're going to get attention, and they're strategic, they're savvy business people, they're going to start off that way for three, five years, and then they're going to move on, do what they want to do. Um, I think what you're saying is beautiful, you really touched my heart, but art is a business, it's a market. Um, I guess you'd have to really know the artist and if that's really what their work is about or not. And most of them, even if it's not, they're going to mask it that it is. Would such a discussion take place in Arizona as far as an American artist uh, versus their geographical origin or is this an issue with American artists? Let me tell you a story. <laughs> in 2001, I was in Iran in the spring, well actually 2000, 2001. And I had an opportunity to bring a lot of contemporary Iranian artist work to Arizona. And I met with Peter Briggs, who was then director of the, of the art museum there. And I showed him some photographs um, and some slides of works by Minou Asadi, who is a very old friend of mine from Tehran. And I said, I have you know, her works and other works that Sami Azar is willing to give me to, to bring here. And he said, well, where is she from? And I said, well, she's Iranian. He said, this doesn't look like Iranian art. And I thought, what does Iranian art look like? Um, in Arizona, the big discussion, of course, aside from, from those kinds of positions would be Native American art. And as you probably know with Native American art, if you can't prove your bloodline, you can't list it as Native American art you have to be able to be registered <laughs> as Native American or you can't list it as Native American art. You can have Native American art that's made in Indonesia or I don't know, someplace else that are some of the little fetishes and so on. So ethnicity and identity in terms of artwork in Arizona is a really big thing, whether it's the uh, Native American art or um, even the way that, that, that some artists construct themselves as Western, so-called Western artists. Going against the grain there, though, are other galleries with a lot of different artists from the region who are not doing anything that looks like Native American art or cowboy art or any of those things, but who are doing their own kind of work. Some of them are working in ceramics, some are working in um, other kinds of media, maybe painting and so on. Um, identity issues um, there in terms of American artists um, yes, it's, it's a big thing, um, but that may be our location.
But that's location and relevant. That's Rele the location. Relevant there. to just the just Native to, American artists. Yeah. Is there more money in Native American art? Possibly is there a relation to the art market as well? I don't where think there's so. a niche for this kind of art that needs to be protected. Uh, uh, in terms of the art market, I think that, well, it's cyclical, as you know. And, and you could probably speak, or either one of you could probably speak more to that. But I think that the, the cycle with that is, um, again, Native American art, Hispanic art, um, Cuban American art, I don't know, any of these isms art. Um, and American art, as we would think of it from the um, earlier period, post war, um, 1950s on forward, I don't know how well that's doing in terms of the art market. Yeah. But yeah. Yes. I, I just want to add one last thing. Um, maybe on a, on a hopeful note, the Gulf is a very good place to be an artist. Mm -hmm. Despite yeah. all the uh, regulations that are that need to be improved and the, uh, all the stories that we hear about uh, uh, what you can and can't display, it's still a very good place. The, the people in the Gulf are very welcoming to, to artists from all over the world. The, 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 uh, the UAE uh, um, displayed alongside prominent Emiratis such as Sam Abdel Aziz, displayed the Tariq Hussain, who is a Kuwaiti artist of Palestinian descent in the, in the, national, in the, in the pavilion in Venice. Uh, uh, this piece uh, behind me is by, uh, uh, by Camille Zakharia, who is Lebanese, who represented Bahrain in Venice. Uh, uh, the Qatar Museum, the UAE, the Sharjah Museum, uh, the Abu Dhabi centers, the Dubai centers, they, there is more globalization happening here in, in the UAE, in the Gulf, uh, than anywhere else I've seen. I have not seen this. Uh, uh, in, in other countries that I've traveled to around the region, you mostly see art from that country only. Mm -hmm. But here in the, in the UAE, in the Gulf, you really get a taste of uh, globalized uh, uh, identity. Artists from all over the world reflecting a global identity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to quote from Amin Ma'louf, who has written two major uh, books on uh, identity, and one a biography and one on identity, and uh, its consequence, actually. And um, he proposes that Arab identity is fluid, unsettled, and ever-changing. And it's, uh, it's the same with Muna Khatoum, who for, um, answers many of these questions in relation to identity. At the, the, uh, and I quote here, and in particular to works that may seem to other is very specific to the region. She says, I think artworks are rooted in one's history and life experiences, so she does not deny that. So inevitably, there is a sense of conflict, threat, and instability of my work. But it is not meant as an illustration of my own experience. And that actually uh, resonates very much with what uh, uh, Tissam has uh, described as her presentation of the art. As art doesn't necessarily have to be linked directly to what is generally, unfortunately, has been stereotyped as uh, Emirati or stereotyped as Arab. So in many ways we look possibly at identity and categorization of art as a negative approach to the description of art, maybe as a defense mechanism or a response to the stereotype that for many years has been uh, overtaking the uh, description of what is Arab and what is, uh, and the role of gender and, and other issues. And so maybe it's time for us to just uh, leave, leave the subject at rest for a while and uh, look more at what's happening, for example, in Egypt, where I don't think Egyptians at this time would shy away from saying what or describing how the art has contributed or played in the Arab Spring in Egypt and in the recent uh, demonstrations in the Tahrir Square and how art has moved actually out of the galleries and into the squares and into the public arena, engaging with the public. I think we need to look more at these issues that are in direct relation with what's happening now in the region as more representative of the region than just the giving titles to whatever art is coming from or going to. And as uh, Sultan mentioned earlier, it, uh, it is not new for uh, artists from different countries to be participating in pavilions, for example, in Venice, 
that belong to uh, Western countries. For example, Emily Jasser was invited to participate in the Italian pavilion in Venice. And this is happening. And it, 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 one does not have to be a Palestinian to, uh, to, to uh, do art that relates or expresses their feelings about what's happening in Palestine. And the same for the environment, the same for many issues. And I think it's, uh, it, there is a need to differentiate in the discussion between the naming the art and naming the artist versus what is happening, the content of the art, and uh, what, what are we engaged with at this moment, particularly in Arab Spring as it takes shape. Thank you.